Hello and welcome. This is Hear Her Sports, the podcast of long form, intimate profiles of female athletes breaking boundaries, speaking up, and living with power and confidence. I am your host and producer, Elizabeth Emery. I'm so thrilled to introduce this week's guest, triathlete Khadija Diggs. Khadija totally blew me away. She is such a connector of people and a real doer. Just wait until you hear about Diversity Infusion Syndicate by Khadija or DISC. We talked about her training, coaching herself, being daring, the DISC athletes and program, and racing and training in hijab. Khadija was super fun to talk to, so I hope you enjoy our conversation. But before we get going, I want to share with you a podcast I just discovered. It's called Strides Forward and is about women who run ultra and marathon distances. The host and producer, Cherie Turner, creates episodes intermingling her own insights and observations and audio from the conversations she has with these long, long distance runners. Strides Forward comes out in series with all episodes connected by a similar theme. The first series was about experiences from the 56 mile Comrades Marathon in South Africa. The current series called Running in a Woman's Body just started last month and covers topics of menopause, reds, and pregnancy. Whether you're a runner or not, these stories are so exciting and so interesting. Take a listen in all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on the website stridesforwardpodcast.com. Now let's get to Khadija. Today's guest is Khadija Diggs. Khadija is a mother, works full-time, and is a triathlete on Team USA. Her mission is to promote a positive image of Muslim women and Islam in general through sport, Khadija competed in her first triathlon in 2012 as part of an initiative for her sorority, Gamma Gamma Chi Sorority Incorporated. And right there and then, she fell in love with the sport. Since 2012, she has entered more than 40 events and successfully completed all but one of them. Khadija is currently ranked in the top 5% of her age group by Ironman Triathlon. She is also the first African-American woman to represent Team USA in a long course triathlon and the first Muslim to represent Team USA in any multi-sport event. Some of her career highlights include making the 2018 and 2017 U.S. long course team, earning a PR of 1257.34 at IM Florida in 2017, earning a PR of 536 at IM Chattanooga 70.3, also in 2017, earning second at her first international race in Havana, Cuba, and earning an invitation to Olympic distant nationals in 2015 and 2017. Khadija also has an active social media, including great gatherings on YouTube. Links to all that is on our show notes. And I welcome you, Khadija. Thank you so much for making time to be on the podcast. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And and, and recognizing my ego, I must share, I upped my PR just last year in Havana to 507. Nice. So, yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. And well, thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I think one thing I'd like to ask about first and to get us started is to hear more about your beginnings as a triathlete. And, you know, I know you said you did it with your sorority, but I'd like to hear sort of, you know, like inner details of that and find out, like, how did that come about? And maybe if you remember, you know, like, where were you at physically and mentally at that time so that it seemed like a really good time to do a triathlon? I, I I do a lot of anybody who knows me knows I do a lot of things that seem like a really good idea at the time. <laughs> that's that's kind of my mode of operation. Even my, my line name is called B Hype. Um, our mascot is a B, so it's B E Hype because I'm always it's like Khadija's always trying to do something crazy. Just hold on for the ride. So. <laughs> So so was it some a friend that said, hey, let's do this? No, I, I was responsible for the health initiative that year for the sorority. And uh, to kick it off, I wanted to do an event. And it was like, I didn't want to do a 5K or I just wanted to do something different, something that I had never done before. And somebody at work was talking about Ironman triathlons. I was like, well, that's so far. He's like, well, you know, my wife does these little sprint ones. And I was like, oh, really? So I looked it up and signed up for it, not even really knowing what I was signing up for. (laughs) And yeah, so then then what? Like you signed up for it and then you were like, holy cow, I got to figure this out? Yeah, well, 
I've been a swimmer all of my life. I've never been a competitive swimmer, but um, my father had been in, in, in college and he's an open water swimmer. So I learned how to swim in open water. So I figured that part was okay. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, it's the opposite. They're afraid of the open water. That I wasn't afraid of it. I was not a great swimmer, but that was the least of my worries. Because that's a big barrier, I think, for a lot of people figuring like, oh, I got to swim in a lake or an ocean or something. Yeah. And especially in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. So and that perspective, I was kind of an anomaly. And I ran track in college and I had been doing 5Ks and stuff like that, trying to stay in shape. The crazy thing was I did not own a bike. I grew up, I kind of grew up all over, but mostly in New York. And I didn't ride a bike very often and I didn't own a bike. So I had a little spin bike that I would use when I watched TV. So I, I primarily trained on that. And then I think like a week or two before the event, I bought a steel fixie from Walmart, and that's what I raised. You know, I read that somewhere, and I am a cyclist, and I just thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> like, that's something else to ride a triathlon on that bike. Yeah, it was – It was. I, I had no clue. The race was in Lake Lanier, Georgia, and if you've ever cycled in North Georgia, the hills were outrageous. I mean, thank God I happened to be a strong individual, but, yeah, it was – the smile on my face when you saw they have a picture of me coming into the finish of the bike and I have this huge smile on my face. It was a thank God <laughs> that's where everybody's getting off the bike smile, I promise you. So you talked a little bit about uh, your father was a swimmer and you, you were a runner as a young kid. What was life like growing up? Were you sporty? Was the family sporty? I mean, assuming since your dad was a swimmer, but you know, like, did you have yeah. a support system for sports, you know, brothers and sisters? Yeah, it was, I just, I have one brother. He is seven years younger than me and we did every sport you can imagine. He was, um, he, well, he actually got everything. He's actually smarter and more athletic <laughs> than I am. But he played football, baseball, t-ball. Uh, he did swim competitively. He was a very good swimmer. And I did oh gosh, I did gymnastics, I took dance lessons, I played basketball, Any anything that was out there, we tried it. And I even remember one year, my father had, um, he had a gas station in New Hampshire and I wanted to run track, but they didn't have a team in our area. So he pulled together just some kids in the neighborhood and we actually had a track team. It's a joke, it, it comes off as a joke, but it's literal, literally what happened. The junkyard man's daughter was on our track team. And we we qualified for Hershey Nationals with just this ragtag team. We wore white t-shirts and blue shorts. We didn't have like real track gear and we, we trained hard and our relay team did really well. Cool. Well, you know, I'm yeah. I'm really impressed. It seems like you have such a good sense of how to train. And I understand that you coach mostly yourself, you have input, but you most mostly coach and devise your plan yourself. Like, how did you learn yeah. that? Because it's not easy, I don't think, to understand training principles and to, especially, I think it's, dif I personally find it difficult to coach myself. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. I've had some catastrophes at races and I always went back and wanted to know why. One of the things I like about coaching myself is I think I have a good sense of what I'm feeling and, and what I'm doing. I think it makes me race smarter and train smarter. Um, but I do have people who who I reach out to. Uh, my mentor, Coach Alanga Thandaway, he has been doing triathlons since the 80s. I work with him a lot of my open water swimming. Uh, he's the first person who invited me to work out with the Metro Atlanta Cycling Club. Uh, he's pushed me up many a hill because I couldn't <laughs> make it up the hill. There's a gentleman, Alfonso Ahuja in Columbus, Georgia. We met at a training camp in Columbus, Georgia. And, you know, he reached out to me about, you know, some things I had communicated to him. And he's really like my voice of reason on monitoring my fatigue and making sure that I incorporate everything that goes on into my life, into my training, and in making the U.S. team and with some of the sponsors that I've had, 
just having really amazing experience triathletes around me. I feel like I'm a student of the sport. I just, I love to read about it. I love to understand other people's training methods. So, and like I said, I've had some like real catastrophes that have made me take a hard look at what I'm, what I'm doing. I just, I love the sport. I love everything about it. It's not just physical. There's a science behind what you do and a mental behind what you do. Cause when you look at me, I'm not, I'm not your typical triathlete. I'm, I'm five, two buck 30, you know, a little chunky. I just, it's just, you know, the mental and the, the science behind it allows me to perform, I think, well for, you know, my age and, you know, my level of experience. Mm-hmm. I sort of assume that you were scientific in your approach. Do you have philosophies, training philosophies? And I imagine you take advantage of tech and things like that as well. Yeah, um, I, I use Training Peaks. I'm a fan of Perf Pro Studio. I keep my watch on at all time, monitoring my resting heart rate and how my heart rate variability shows my level of fatigue. I know if my resting heart rate goes over a certain amount, even if I feel fine, I probably need to take a look at what my next couple of days of training are. And I love my nutrition company, F2C Nutrition. The owner of that company is totally into science. Every time he introduces a new product, he goes over the why of why he's introducing it, what's in it, what the benefits of it are, when to take it. And I enjoy that. I really enjoy that. You mentioned resting heart rate. Do you think a lot about sleep and getting enough sleep? Yeah, I, um, and I know that's one thing that as, as a mom, I never get. That is one of the things that I always have to take into account. I don't get enough sleep and I know that. Very rarely do I get, what do they say, seven to nine hours of sleep. I rarely get that. I might get that two to three nights a week if I'm lucky. I think that's hard, especially, you know, you have a lot going on. And, you know, you do have a lot going on. But, you know, I think all athletes have a lot going on. And there's limited time in a day. So it's not like because you're doing three sports, you're going to do three times as much training. It's just not possible. You know, I find that when I try to add more things to what I'm doing and and tend to add too much, what happens is that my head gets overwhelmed. Like I start not thinking Mm -hmm. as clearly. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're maintaining, I guess, your sanity, but also, you know, mental clarity during this time of, you know, a lot of training. And you, as you mentioned, you have a family and you're, you know, we're in COVID, you're homeschooling and everything that's going on. Yeah, so um, I I try to stay just stay as organized as possible, and I have a little dry erase board that I keep next to me. I put in a, a to do list every day. I kind of okay, what's my priority for the day? What can wait for tomorrow? And then I have a priority list on you know what are the things that the kids need to get done today? What are the things they can wait on and what are the things you know we can do over the weekend in the more casual environment where I'm not having to jump on work calls. So it's just a matter of I I keep my computer open with my Google calendar. I have my work calendar open and then the kids, their school, they go to what's called an online school and they have their planner. So I have all of those things open and Each morning, I just try to review each of them, make sure I don't have anything overlapping. For me, it's organization. And that's what I do for a living. I'm a project manager. So I just try to do my best to project manage everything. And then I recognize, too, I am very lucky. I like my job. I like the people that I work with. And everything else that's going on in my life is a complete joy. I love being a mother. I love triathlon. And the DISC program that I'm working on right now is like a dream come true. There's very few people get to live their passion. And since I've been very engaged in triathlon, I'm totally floored by the path that God has written for me. And I'm just, I just, I feel tired sometimes, but it's like the whole process and it just gives me wings. I love triathlon. So when I'm training, it's it's my me time. It's something that I, w- I want to do. 
And the DISC program is something that I, I want to do. It's something that I asked, I asked for, and God gave it to me. So there's <laughs> no turning back now. <laughs> Talk more about the DISC program. So um, I started a program called the Diversity Inclusion Syndicate by Khadija. I recently pursued my level one USAT coaching certification specifically for that reason. There's a lot of talk about uh, diversity now, um, you know, people having conferences and that type of thing. I like to, to talk about those kind of things, but I'm also an action person. So I decided to take an active role in increasing diversity by selecting three women who were either Muslim or women of color and to give them basically a world-class experience in triathlon. So I wanted to select one woman who had never done a triathlon, one woman who had maybe done a few triathlons but was thinking about, you know, hey, maybe I'd like to do a 70.3 or an Ironman and one young lady who has the potential to make the US team and become an elite triathlete. I was so thrilled by the application poll. We actually selected four young women this year in our first year. So I have discipline coaches and a strength coach and a yoga instructor. And I have a dedicated board of directors who are helping me through on this journey. They've committed to being a part of it with me and I'm, I'm really and they're all people that I have just engaged and have helped me through my triathlon journey. The swim instructor is my mentor who I mentioned earlier, Coach Along at Thandaway. Uh, Guy Mills, he's gonna be helping the young ladies understand cycling data, talking about FTP and threshold and what their pedal stroke should look like. He's also a member of the board of directors. He's a high ranking executive at Clorox. We have our run instructor who is also one of my best friends and she's been my run coach from the very beginning. She's actually a professional runner. She is the Guyanese 10K and 5K record holder. Manjai Hosang, he is our strength instructor and Christy Fenner is our yoga instructor. And then, like I said, I have a dedicated board of directors as well. So wow, it's, um, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's really come together and I can't express the gratitude that I have for the people who are on board with me and recognizing that this is a new thing and really there's no there's no financial gain for them at this point. They're doing it because they trust in my vision, they trust in me as a person, they love triathlon and they're serious about the sport of triathlon and making it a safe place for everyone. Like I said, there's, there, there are no words that I can say to express my gratitude and my joy in doing this program. And I even told them, I said, we later on, we need to think of a, a different name because it's not by Khadija, it's by everyone. Well, that's one thing that struck me is you've built this whole community by having these four athletes and all the coaches and support staff yeah. I mean, what a, what a gift for all these athletes. Yeah. And they're amazing young ladies. They're all very different. One, was, she was born in Jamaica. Uh, the other is the daughter of immigrants from Nigeria. One young lady is like myself. She's African-American Muslim who lives here in Atlanta. And then another young lady, African-American lady from Florida. So they're very different. The one single thread is that they are all, they're all givers that you can just, it's in their soul to be givers. And that's one of the things that I, I, I wanted in the athletes. I wanted them to, when they come out of the program to not just be great triathletes, but to be change agents within the triathlon community. And they are all extremely intelligent. I told them at the reveal when we let everyone know who the athletes were going to be. I was like, I need to get hooked on phonics. These <laughs> these ladies are all uh, really smart, you know. And one of them is she's a uh, educator at Georgia Tech. Uh, the other young lady, uh, she is an engineer by education, but she's a teacher right now. She made a conscious decision to be a stay-at-home mom with her boys. And uh, being a teacher gave her an avenue to do that. 
uh, the other young lady, um, she is an executive in Florida, the youngest of all the athletes. She's a PhD student in Michigan. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is so quite a group. Yeah. So it's like, I won't talk about anything but tri triathlon. That's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So logistically, you know, I gather they're, they're all over the country. Logistically, how are you going to organize this program? Are you going to guys going to get together? Do you do Zoom, you know, like monthly, weekly? What? How is it going to all work out? Yeah, we are having specialty uh, Zoom get togethers. We recently had uh, Let's Talk About Swimming Zoom session. We talked about the history of uh, swimming in the African-American community, just the history of some great African-American swimmers. We'll be doing that for cycling, running. Their yoga sessions are virtual because our yoga instructor is in Maryland. Two of the athletes are here in Atlanta. So I've committed to doing uh, one workout per week in person with them. All of the athletes, I meet with them between 15 and 30 minutes each week to go over, you know, how their week was, what was in their plan. We'll be using a lot of video. So it's, it's a combination. My intention was to have all of the athletes in Atlanta, but like I said, the applications were, were compelling. Mm -hmm. They were compelling enough for me to take the chance of saying, okay, we're going to take two athletes that are not in Georgia and move forward with them. And they're, they're showing the commitment already. They're showing the commitment. So sure. It would be terrible to waste the opportunity. Yeah. What have you found so far that these four athletes are interested in learning? Each of the sports has a lot of particularities. I mean, you grew up swimming in open water, but that's not true with everyone. Yeah. You mentioned you have a strength training coach. You know, that's certainly important. I, I think it's really interesting that you included that and also that you included yoga. So what have they been interested in mostly in learning and, and what do they need help in? Well, they all love the yoga classes. Uh, and that was the first one before we did anything. They had their first yoga session, even before they had assessments, before they did a mile test, before I filmed them swimming, before we filmed them running, anything. We went to yoga and we talked about focus and breath and breathing and making sure that after we have a hard day, we stretch or we do a yoga session. They have yoga once a week. And Christy talks with them about, you know, keeping their hip flexors open, breathing and focus. And I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of triathletes, athletes, period, miss out on. Mm -hmm. And the strength training coach, he's he's very scientific as well. I think I've picked a lot of people that <laughs> are in my frame of mind when it comes to sport. They're into the, to the science of it. Like I said, each of the ladies is very different, not only in personality and background, but in their abilities. The young lady I told you who's a PhD student, she's already an amazing swimmer. Her pace in the water is about 110 per 100, but she doesn't have a lot of open water experience. She's also run cross country competitively and she has raced criterium races on the bike. So she's very strong in all three disciplines. She's just never done all three together. Yeah. Do you talk about transitions and what are your, uh, I don't know, what are your tips with transitions? Keep it simple. I see a lot of people with so much stuff in triathlon. Just keep it simple and be very deliberate. Uh, if you rush too much, that's when you make the mistakes. So just keep it simple, be very deliberate and don't try anything new. I mean, I I practiced a flying mounts and dismounts, I don't know, for a month on the grass before I even attempted to do it, really do it. And that's what you do now? Yes. I, yeah. I keep my shoes clipped in. I, I've been doing that for about five years now, six years. Do you run with socks? Um, 70.3 and up, yes. Olympic and sprints, no. Got it. Yeah. And do you have a strategy going into each race? And will you talk with your four athletes about strategizing? Yes. As a matter of fact, the first event that we are participating in, it'll be 
a multi-sport event, Rev 3. There's a group called Fast Chicks. They have a, a meetup every year, and we're going to be going to that particular race, Rev 3 Williamsburg, uh, in June together. I've already sent them the race course because I want them to be thinking about the race course, visualizing the race course. And then with each of them, as we approach the race, talk to them about what they feel their strengths are and how they are going to go through the race and to visualize themselves going through the race, understanding that they know the, they know the course. But yeah, strategy is always important, knowing when to push, knowing when not to push, understanding where you need to be out of the water, where you need to be out of the run and have a contingency plan and a contingency plan for your contingency plan. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think that you must have had some less than perfect races. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the two races that strike me that I remember the most, I think the most painful is the first time I went to long course nationals, I got out of the water a little bit behind where I thought I should be. I pushed really hard on the bike, a little bit harder than I should have. My nutrition wasn't secured. I, I lost my nutrition. So I grabbed the on course nutrition and that didn't work out very well. I'm a borderline diabetic. They were offering Gatorade, which as you know, has a lot of sugar. So that didn't go well. And then, um, I got a flat tire, which was okay. One of the things in the Metro Atlanta Cycling Club is that to be a member, you have to be able to change a tire in five minutes. I had gotten it down to three. And when I look back on my Garmin data, I changed that tire in less than three minutes and I was on my way. And then I dropped my chain. Ugh. So <laughs> I was able to correct that, and, but I still, and I didn't realize it. I actually, in my age group, I pulled the top, I think it was the top 15, we're going to go to Worlds. I actually pulled into transition in like 17th place, which was okay, but I didn't know that. I just thought all this stuff had happened. I didn't, I had no idea where I was. I usually count bikes when they stack us together. I didn't do that. And I just started running and I ran at a much faster pace than I should have. And I passed out at mile six. I only remember mile four. So I don't know what I was doing for two miles. But, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that not, not only was that a, a horrific race, it was very painful because that was, that was my one goal for the year. Mm. Fortunately, I had another race after that. A couple of weeks later, I did my first Ironman. So it really ended the year on a good note because I was absolutely thrilled to complete my first Ironman. So I was doing my first Ironman and my first marathon, another one of my great ideas, <laughs> <laughs> on the same day. Yeah. And um, I did really well. My goal was to do 13 hours and change. It was heavy change. I think I did 1358 or 57. I was pleased and I was happy and it allowed me to end the season on a good note. Yeah. And then the other race was New Orleans 70.3. I spent six hours in the medical tent after that race. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you love competing. I've read in many places that you really love to compete and that you are competitive. What do you like about competing? Just, I don't know, just the joy of it, the power, this, just the feel, the exhilaration of and the, the funny thing is I'm extremely competitive, but I don't, I don't like to just win. If I lose and it was a great race, I'm cool with that. I just like to see everybody show up fit and happy and ready to go. And then we just go at it like warriors. I just love it. Do you have a particular mindset when, you know, you're going at the race? I mean, what are you thinking about at the start line? Just one discipline at a time uh, on the swim I try to focus on my breath and my form. The bike is where I get a little bit crazy. I love the power of the bike. I go nuts on the bike. I literally, I'm passing people, talking trash. It's it just, yeah. 
if there's a turnaround, I point at people like I got you now. It's it's no way. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. Well, that's so funny because you weren't a cyclist before. No, no, not at all. I, 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 I love the bike. I just I love being on the bike. There's a path, a Silver Comet Trail that goes from Atlanta to Alabama. I have invariably just gotten on my bike and ridden Alabama and back for absolutely no reason. That's cool. A thank you to everyone who has been ordering books through our bookshop page. Your support means a lot to us as we work to bring you great stories with astounding female athletes. The list of guest recommended books is growing, so check that out. But please know that once you are on the Hear Her Sports page, all of the books in your order support us. Khadija's all-time favorite book is the autobiography of Malcolm X. Order it or any other book in our shop, hearhersports.com slash bookshop. Thank you. And back to Khadija. How did you learn how to cycle? You know, like never having done it before. I mean, as you said, you were you were strong, but there's so much more involved in cycling. Like you've got to be able to do it near other people and there's being able to control the bike. And like, how did that go? Well, I, I have to say joining the Metro Atlanta Cycling Club was the best thing that I ever did. Some of the members are just casual riders. They have people who race just cycling competitively and some triathletes. And literally, I give them all the credit. Everything that I know about bikes and about cycling, at least the core of it, I learned from them. And like I said, to become a member, you have to take a test. You literally have to take a test, like a written test. Really? About all the components on your bike. You have to be able to change a tire within a, a certain period of time. You have to have gone on X number of rides with the team. They're very focused on cycling safety and i'm i'm very proud when i wear my mac jersey i mean it's like it's a badge of honor in atlanta to belong to the metro atlanta cycling club that's cool do they have a big women's uh, community there are more now when i first went out there weren't as many but yeah and it's funny when um (laughs) when we ride with other clubs some of the guys at the other clubs kind of grumble when they call (laughs) us lady mac when the lady mac shows up because they know, they know that these women know how to ride. I mean, they're pulling just like the guys are pulling. We have a couple of, one of the guys said, he said, you, he said, dang, you climb like a billy goat. I was like, I, at first I was like, okay, I don't want to be called a billy goat, but <laughs> it's, it's a badge of honor. That's they're, a compliment. Really, yeah. I was like, okay, <laughs> billy goat. I don't know if I'm going to be a billy goat, but. Uh. Yeah. That's great. Do you use uh, power? when you're training? I train with power. I do not race with power. Got it. Yeah. Uh, how do you train with power? What are you using? I use Perf Pro Studio for indoor training. And when I want to train with power out in the road, I put on the Garmin pedals, but I do most of my power training indoors. And then I use my outdoor training to kind of test my philosophy mm-hmm. for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah. You've spoken and written that one of your biggest challenges has been related to your race kit. And I'd really like to understand better where the conflict is. So if you could, are you able to break it down like super simply to go over the regulations in triathlon and also your own obligations? And I don't know if you call it obligations, but your own obligations of wearing hijab and sort of Mm -hmm. where that conflict comes in and why it's a problem. So... The triathlon rules state you cannot have any compression uh, below the elbow, from the elbow to the wrist. ITU, it's from the shoulder to the wrist and below the knee. That's it. And it's just on the swim. So for cycling and running, you can wear whatever you want. Whatever you want. All the controversy is over just the swim. And it has to do with flotation? No, it's just compression. Okay. It has nothing to do. Well, flotation for everybody. Of course, all of the materials cannot have any neoprene or anything like that. But that's what all the controversy has been over. I've been threatened with disqualification. The last time I was at nationals, I was actually called for disqualification because it was non-wetsuit. And uh, a race official who obviously did not read the, the list of, they get 
a list of athletes that they need to watch for, did not read that list, he called me for a DQ. And then when I went over and asked him, he said that, oh, you wore a wetsuit. I said, no, I didn't. You can even check my transition area. So I went and called the, the head official. And the funny thing was the head official knew me by name. He's like, oh, hey, Khadija, how are you doing? <laughs> and the guy who called me for the disqualification, he probably would have peed on himself if, if, if it wouldn't have embarrassed him in front of all of the rest of the people. Uh, I just have so many questions. So that they are, they're assuming because you're covered from head to toe, basically, that it's illegal. It's a wetsuit. I've even been pulled... I got uh, literally, I had, I had a volunteer grab my arm at a race and I was in a Team USA kit. I was, a, I was literally in my national team, my national federation kit. And he said, you can't race. And once again, somebody who knew me, the announcer was like, hold on, wait a minute. She's in a ITU approved kit. She's on the national team. I know her, leave her alone. And I, it was, I was using the race as a tune-up race for Worlds. So I, was, I, I wasn't, you know, trying to be to the front of the start or anything like that. So I was jumping in with a friend who was also doing it for fun. And she had heard about some of the things that had happened to me at race starts. And she kind of looked at me. She's like, you deal with that every race? And I was like, well, it's not every race, but it, it does happen. Because she was surprised at how... You know, I went from, yo, you know, get your hands off of me to focused on it's time to swim. I just, I have this, I have, I gratefully have this ability to go from laughing or sheer anger to total focus in like three seconds. It doesn't, it just doesn't phase me. What's the percentage of triathletes who are wearing hijab? Oh, I, I can give you an exact number in the U.S., Three. Three people. Yeah, and I'm the only one on the U.S. team. There's a, a one young lady, and actually we raced together at Ironman Arizona uh, in 2019. Yeah. Wow. We, we purposely planned to race together because there's one young lady. Uh, we look nothing alike. We both happen to be African-American, but she's almost six feet tall. She's gone to races, and, and they've said to her, are you Khadija? And they've come to me and asked me, are you Jerry? No, I'm not Jerry. Jerry's almost six feet tall. I mean, another thing that struck me is that, I mean, you have very specialized gear. And I think I read that most of it is custom made. You know, what are other women who want to race doing? Where are they getting what they need? They aren't. This is another thing that I'm thrilled about. I use Tri-Serena sportswear for my practice kits. I wear their long sleeve swimsuits and their run tights, and I sew a chamois into the swimsuit, and I use that for practice gear. But I can't race in it because it's compressive below the knee and it's compressive in the arms. So I reached out to Tri-Serena when I started the DISC program. I was like, hey, you know, she remembered me because we had spoken at Ironman Augusta one year. And... um. I've ordered her stuff for probably five years now, four or five years now. I said, hey, I'm, I'm starting this team and I'd like to know if we could get discounted practice gear. And she said, we will send you practice kits, no cost. So they sent me the practice kits for the athletes. So they all have their, their new tri Serena practice kits. She also said, you know, hey, I'm working on this full coverage kit. She is a skin cancer survivor. So that's, that was the foundation of and the theme of what she offers. Hmm. And I said, I would love to. So she will be, Tri-Serena will be the first company to offer full coverage kits off the shelf. And I'm working with USAT to get them approved. So there will be, there's only one, but she's out there selling full coverage kits that are ITU approved, that uh, USAT and ITU approved, that they can buy off the shelf. That's fantastic. It's also kind of blowing yeah. my mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think she knows, but I don't know that Stefani knows what this means to Muslim women 
to women. I have a friend, she's not Muslim, but she burns horribly. She's interested in the kid. I mean, this is a game changer for a lot of women who who don't race or who race uh, gingerly or, you know, take a lot of time in transition simply because, you know, they have other issues. And I don't even want to call being Muslim an issue. They're either Muslim. I had a young lady who was, I think she was Mormon. She asked me about my kit and I didn't realize that they had uh, the, the women wanted a full coverage kits if they're Mormon. So it, I think it opens the door to a, a lot of women who, who want to race cover it for whatever reason. It also breaks down a lot of assumptions about different women and what they can and can't do and what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Because yeah. I know I shock a lot of people at races. It bothered me when I first started racing that people kind of treated me like, a visitor like oh isn't that nice a little muslim girl wants to race but then when they saw i was competitive they're like oh the little muslim girl wants to race yeah we just want to race like everybody else we come in all different shapes sizes and competitive edges some people just want to you know be out there and have fun i want to race what is the transition like with your full coverage swim kit into the bike Oh, it's, it's the same as everybody else's, really. I race in just a swim cap, or if it's cold, I use a swim hijab. And a lot of people, they wear these hoods that look like swim hijabs anyway. And then they put on neoprene caps or something like that. But I just swim with my suit on. When I get to my bike, I have my hijab hanging off of my seat post. I put my hijab on and slide my cap off. And I'm gone. So you're racing in your your swim. Do you call it a swimsuit? Your swim kit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's a it's a tri kit like everybody else's. Right. Right. And it has a chamois in it and everything. And on the run, when I get off the bike, I slide a, a run skirt on. And usually my race number is attached to it, and it has little slits in it for um, a couple of gels, but I primarily use, I actually 100% use liquid nutrition. I keep the gels as backup, but I don't think I've used them in like four years. Actually, at the end of each year, I have to throw the gels away because they're usually <laughs> fire. Right. I use liquid nutrition. I just have a, a little, it's like, a, I think it's a liter. I don't think anything is that much, but it's a little pack that I wear for longer races, for sprints. I don't, I don't use any, I consume everything I need on the bike and I just run, run straight through. Hmm. It's hard to talk to athletes these days without mentioning COVID. So here's my COVID question for you. <laughs> We've been in pause for so long now, you know, like it's been almost a year. And at least for me, I've had these sort of phases of, you know, thoughts and motivation and hope and I'm sort of wondering where you are now in, in all of that about your training, your goals, and any sort of long-term planning you've been doing. You mentioned, for example, that you have a race with your four athletes in June. Yes. So my last race, and it's funny, I got a Facebook notification. It was uh, three days. It was a year ago. It was in oh, Mexico. Geez. <laughs> yeah. And I almost cried because racing in Havana is very special to me. I have, I have friends and family there. And it's just, when I go there to race, it's it's more than just a race for me. I usually go also in the summer, I take my youngest two children there and I miss, I miss everyone so much. So that, that part is hard. And I miss going to races and seeing everybody. Um, I went through, I think it was almost like a six week period. I hardly did anything. I was just like, when is this gonna be over? Um, but I feel light at the end of the tunnel now. I am booked for Ironman Chattanooga in May 23rd, and then Rev 3, the 26th of June, and Worlds is in September, and I'm Ironman Florida in November. So I have those slated. I intend to race, depending on you know where we are at the COVID situation. I think before I get on a plane, I would like to get the COVID vaccine, all the other races I'll be driving to. But I think I'm in a place where I 
feel comfortable racing, especially the fact that I race with my own nutrition. I can kind of be not really be in contact with people. So I don't know. Did you have to qualify for Worlds? How does that work? Yeah, long course nationals, you have to yeah. do what they did with the team since they canceled long course nationals last year is, I don't know what the cutoff was, but they brought most of us back and said, we don't have to re-qualify for 2021 since they did not have nationals for 2020. Do you have anything else that you're looking forward to? I mean, I assume competition is a big thing that you're looking forward to in 2021, but anything else? And how have you altered your your training plans now that you are going to be racing? Um, so I've, I've gone into my, my normal base training like I would be doing at this uh, period of time. When I do triathlon Havana, I basically do it off of base training. I don't do like a peak and a taper, and which is surprising because that's where I had my my PR. <laughs> and I did it off of base training. And I was really looking forward to seeing what I could do last year because I had changed a lot of things in respect to my diet and my weight training. And I felt great. Um, and I felt like 2020 was really going to be a good year. So um, I'm going back into um, into that base training right now. Um, and I'm employing some of the things that I had employed prior to the shutdown. And we'll just see where things go. I think my biggest thing that I'm looking forward to is one of my children is graduating from high school. She got accepted to her dream school. So nice. uh, making sure that that, yeah, she wanted to go to SCAD. She's an amazing artist. And some of her artwork is actually on my um, my Instagram page. Cool. Okay. So making sure that that comes to fruition for her. I'm not a trust fund baby. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're making, you know, we're, we're doing scholarships and, you know, talking to people and, um, you know, budgeting and figuring out how we're going to make that happen. Seeing the, the disc athletes, just, I want them to really enjoy, enjoy the experience. I want something good to come out of this for them. So those are the two big things, even more so than my own racing. I think those are the two big things that are on my mind for this year. And continuing to talk about the future, both for DISC and for your own self, like five years from now, 10 years from now, what are you hoping the DISC program accomplishes and that you accomplish? For me, I, I told my kids I want to race till I die. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I literally, I definitely won't have as aggressive a race schedule as I've had in the past. But every year I, I set a goal that seems kind of ridiculous and I go after it. Sometimes it takes me two years, three years to get that goal, but I go after it. And I'm going to continue to do that based on my level of athletic ability and in and, and my age. And some of it is I'm probably too old for it, but I'm going to go for it anyway. They told me I was too old to start trying to be a competitive triathlete when I started, when I finally said, you know, hey, you know, I'm going to try to make the U.S. team. And I'm like, you know, you just started doing this a couple of years ago. Aren't you a little old? No, no, I'm not. I'm fine. So I, I'll continue to do that. And with the DISC program, this is not a one and done. It's something that I want to continue to do. And I'm very open about sharing the fact that I'd like to see a Muslim or an African-American Olympian world champion come out of this. That's exciting. Yeah. I just, I'd, I'd like, I'd like to see that, see that happen. What's your 2021 goal? I'm trying to chase a podium at world championships. Excellent. So we'll, see. we'll see. I mean, it's, I've gotten a little bit better every year. The, the travel, adjusting to the travel and all the excitement around the world. I don't know how people do it. It's, it's a lot. And I think the fact that it's going to be a full iron distance race this year versus being that quasi in between ITU distance is good for me because the bike is 112 miles and that's my strength. My running is really improving. I've only done marathons after doing a 112 mile bike ride, <laughs> <laughs> but um, every one has gotten at least 10 minutes faster. No kidding. Yeah. So that's and, a lot. 
yeah, and I'm obviously getting older. So my first was 2015. I think I did sort of 517 or something like that. And I, this year, the Ironman Arizona, my goal was to make sure that I was under five hours. And I did a 459. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was heavy change, but it was four it hours. <laughs> yeah, so, but I think I can do a 4.30 this. I think I can do a 4.30. I really do. What makes you good at being a triathlete? One of my hashtags is never give up on yourself. And it's it's not just a hashtag. Every race, even if I have to adjust my immediate goal at that second in time. Like I said, I've only I've only not finished one race. I had a sprint race where I got a flat tire and I don't know, I couldn't get, I just couldn't get the tire off the rim. It took me like 30 minutes to change the tire. I just could not get it off. I, and I literally came into transition dead last, but I didn't quit. I didn't care. I never want my kids to see me quit ever. That's important. So hopefully that's something that um, I've instilled in them. You're not always going to be number one. You're not always going to, you know, it's not always going to be glorious, but I want you to always be the kind of person that you know, people can depend on and you follow through. That if you say you're going to do something, you do it. I think that's one reason that I really love sports because there is the competitive part of it, but there's also everything else that leads up to that. Yeah. Humility. Just, just, there's so much, so many lessons to be learned. Yeah. Was there anything else you want to finish up on? No, just thank you for having me. I've had quite a few opportunities to, to share my story and I'm really excited about sharing DISC and what's happening with DISC, sharing the fact that it's not just Khadija's program, it's it's the people's program as far as I'm concerned. Like even my uh, nutrition sponsor, F2C Nutrition, as soon as I mentioned it, she literally called me, what can we do to help, you know? So they're going to be sending the athletes a starter package and they're going to take the time to sit down with them and explain to them, you know, what they're receiving, how to use it, when to use it. And then try Serena, just the way that they've said, yes, we're on board. I'm, I'm grateful. Gratitude is literally my superpower. It gives me wings. Well, it has been an absolute honor to have you on the podcast, to hear you speak and read your writing, preparing to talk to you. You're really an inspiration in the community that you've set up and the support system that you have. Oh, thank you so much. And I, like I said, I'm grateful. I, I'm floored every day I wake up and I said, this is what God has written for me. Wow. I can't believe it. Well, thank you. Really, thank you. I know that you're very busy and have a lot of activity, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, best to get ready to go to the pool. Go. All right. <laughs> have a good workout. All right. Bye. Well, that's it for this week. It is always terrific when you guys spread the word about Hear Her Sports. So thank you and keep doing it. Also, thank you to Khadija for spending time on the show. Find links to all the goodies she talked about in the show notes. Subscribe for free to Hear Her Sports on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Seasons are switching and the pandemic looks like it will end at some point in 2021. So send me a note about what you're interested in this year, what sports or athletes are your favorites. As a matter of fact, I have a listener suggested episode coming up soon. Remember to join Patreon at patreon.com slash hearhersports. It's been so fun to share little extra audio bits with everyone who has signed up. Continue to wear your mask. Please stay healthy and get outside. Spring sun is here. I am so excited. This is such a big deal for us in gray Cleveland. While 44% of athletes are women, only 4% of the media coverage is about women. Hear Her Sports aims to shift the scale while inspiring women to be their best. Until next time, this is Elizabeth Emery for Hear Her Sports. Bye-bye.